31. Let's call this meeting to order. Um, we are the Stormwater Ad Hoc Advisory Task Force, meeting on April 4th. Um, we are currently short Megan, and John, John, and Emery. and Emery, and Norma has resigned. So, I don't have eight. Um, we're going to be recording this this evening. Thank you to Ruth. Um, we have minutes from last meeting, which was March 14th. Did everybody have a chance to look over those? And were there any comments or edits that you want to propose? Those are draft minutes. So we want to move to the second. I'll second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Thank you. I was not here. There's <clears throat> I want to welcome any guests here tonight who aren't on the um, on the task force. And uh, if you haven't already signed in, please do. Um, on the um, agenda, we have public comments. Uh, what I was going to suggest is that tonight we actually just open up our discussion about uh, what, you know, the fairness and equitable issue, which is really the focus of this task force, so that everybody in this room, I uh, think, should participate in that discussion. Um, so if there are any um, urgent comments that people want to bring up now, I invite those comments. Otherwise, I would say let's wait until after Jim's um, presentation on example uh, formulas for the utility fee, and um, and then we can all have our our chance to contribute. So, could I ask one question? I noticed in the minutes that uh, you were going to ask for the email addresses for those people that signed in, so that they could possibly be sent the minutes of the meeting through email. And uh, so, if you've signed in, please leave your email address also. Yep. And we have really there is a space there. For we've been really, I think, great for trying to get the public involved. Right. So yeah. I hope that's happening. I don't have even get your address on there and we'll somehow get it to you. Well, the minutes are also being posted on the DCW website. So that's another way to, to, uh, to access all the information. But also, Jim has put together a great um, resource on the DCW website of a, a lot of uh, documentation that's available in the public domain. So uh, I appreciate that. I've been using that a lot. Um, next on the agenda was reading the final council charge to the committee, which was, um, I think, approved the evening of our last meeting. Um, so. First meeting. First meeting. Yes, first meeting. Sorry. So, in City Council, upon the recommendation of Councilor Jesse M. Adams, <coughs> Councilor Paul D. Spector, and Councilor William H. Dwight, ordered that, whereas the City of Northampton faces significant new expenses to maintain our stormwater drainage system, and whereas, though all the work is needed and beneficial, it is not a matter of choice, and whereas the federal government is mandating many improvements, and whereas in the past the system has been funded by the general fund, now, therefore, be it ordered, the City Council hereby creates a stormwater ad hoc advisory task force as an advisory body to the City Council. The task force will have the following charge. To deliberate in public and conform to the principles of best practices as referenced in the City's best practices final recommendations. To examine ways in which these costs could be funded, looking at what other communities have done in our own enterprise fund system recommend the general principles which should guide the new funding with particular focus on equity and transparency, to offer recommendations about actual formulas that might be employed. The members of the task force shall be selected by March 15th and submitted to the city, nine members by each city councilor, one member selected by the Chamber of Commerce, one member selected by the Board of Public Works, and one member selected by the nonprofit community. On to the next 
I couldn't quite hear what you said in regards to when I got an opportunity to speak, but I'd like to speak to what you just read. Please do. All right. My name is Paul Walker, 52 Gilrain Terrace. I have a great deal of love for this city. I was a Chamber of Commerce Director for 20 years. And some things that I <clears throat> stay tuned in on is our government agencies and their programs and so on and so forth. The one that came to my light or came barreling down on me was when I heard about the committee being set up and starting to move on to address storm water runoff. With that, I made some contacts. I have a friend on the planning board outside of this state of Massachusetts, and I do have some other contacts through the Chamber of Commerce of years ago, and I stay in touch with some of them. Stormwater. Recently, and I have the paperwork here, a federal judge ruled the EPA overstepped its authority trying to regulate water as a pollutant that was overturned in the state of Virginia. Bangor, Maine has taken the issue on. I was on the phone today with a representative from the state of Maine. He just lost his mother and he's missed the last two meetings, but he will be back in touch with me within a week. They feel up there that they're going to oppose it, just like they did in Virginia. They're going to go to court with it. The EPA overstepped its authority. In addition to that, they are working on putting it on a referendum ballot for the citizens of the community to decide if they have to go forward with this. That is why I came tonight to speak to this. If one state, and as you all know, the EPA has created millions of problems for our country in the last two or three years. And I think it's up to our city government, a committee like yours, and our counselors, and I've talked to Mary Ann LaBarge about this about it, quite a bit, not to move too fast, but to stop and look and see if we could not find ourselves in the same situation that we have in the past. It wasn't too many years ago, and I bring up the name John Gere, who ended up getting our parking garage on Main Street. The state came in here, and they were going to take away our parking as it exists today. And John, as the Downtown Business Association president, and I as a chamber, we worked real hard, and we finally won our battle. They could not come in here just because they were going to give us some money and mandate that we change the parking to parallel parking rather than angle parking. So that's my message. Before you go too far getting involved with the EPA, I think we need some help from our congressmen, our state people, to find out why we should set an example in Northampton, Mass to proceed with a judgment overturned by a judge for the whole state. Thank you. Thank you very much. That's actually a, a great perspective for us to begin some conversation tonight. Um, I think one of the things that's maybe started off in the beginning was we lumped together two aspects of what we're trying to deal with um, with this committee. One is the EPA mandates for stormwater, which as it turns out, is a fairly small component of the overall expense that we're facing as a city. The majority of what the city faces is about infrastructure and about flood control, which is related to stormwater, but it is not uh, an EPA-driven uh, issue. It is much more driven by the Army Corps and flood insurance, which all of us will pay for in some way or another, whether we take steps to mitigate future problems with our infrastructure or we allow uh, our ratings for our flood control to potentially uh, be uh, to deteriorate so that we're not able to get uh, as uh, robust of an insurance 
uh, program and potentially have to go to private insurance. So I think there's, it's, it's important for us to start off with the infrastructure discussion, keeping in mind that that's probably three quarters of the cost that we're looking at. And whatever the budgetary costs are, it was good that we read through the charge again tonight because it isn't our, you know, and those, your comment I think is excellent and needs to be brought to the city council because in that body, that decision ultimately will get made. Our charge is really just to look at how a fee structure will get um, created to take on these expenses that are coming our way. That's the purpose of this task force, if I'm not mistaken. Yes, ma'am. Yes, thank you. Um, city councilors don't design a referendum and put it on the ballot. Citizens come in and ask the city councilors with a petition to place it on the ballot. I just want Good clarification. To thank you for that. that. Um, and I just want to follow up with, with you and, and, and your comments about the charge of this committee. I, I, I think you're, you're absolutely correct to point out to Mr. Walker that those types of decisions are inherently political, and our charge is much, much narrower than that. We're not, we're not a policy, a, a city policy board. We're looking at a very narrowly defined task, which is to come up with a rate structure, a, a fee structure that will help us meet um, uh, an, up, an upcoming fiscal requirement. And beyond that, and, and it's up to our, our political leaders to decide if we've done a good job. Um, or not, and then to go ahead with how, how they want to see it implemented. Um, we, we're asked to make recommendations on that. I think we can draw on some of our experience uh, with regard to the other ways we fund these types of public services in, in this community as to how we want to do it. But I, 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 I think one of the things that, that um, I was struck by after last week's or last session's discussion was the amount of time that we spent on talking about programs, and we're really not a program-driven entity here. So um, I spent a lot of time thinking about that in the interim because I thought that the discussion was important, but I also thought it sort of sidetracked us from the work that, that we have to do, particularly if we're going to keep in mind the other charge that we got from the City Council, which is a really constricted time frame. Um, I think the only way we're going to meet that, and we can discuss, you know, that. And that is a charge from the city council is to, to try and to try and meet that time frame. The only way we're going to do that is if we set this narrowly and focus on what what the narrow what the narrow charge that we just read really is asking us to do. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I agree with what what you're you're uh, saying. I understand. However, the thing that I think that a, a few of the people that have express different views about this whole program, and that is locally, as we have tried to think about the fact that we might very well try to get a referendum vote. Do you people, as you are charged to set the fees, are you going to have a total project expense it's going to cost X number of dollars to do what everybody wants done, and you're going to establish the fees. You need to have the cost of the program. Also a good point. We are actually not es uh, establishing the fees. We're making a recommendation okay. to the city council. But at the same time, you would or should, if I was on the committee, would suggest I would like to have a package in front of me, this is what we're going to do, and this is how much money we need. Yes, but in the past, that's not the way it's operated. <clears throat> we come in, and we get the money, and then not all the project gets up. Yes, thank you. Um, if I can recall from the last meeting, it was stated from my colleague, Councilor Paul Spector, that you have your charge to do. Once that charge is completed, then it goes to the Board of Public Work Subcommittee City Council with open hearings, which I agree 100% in best practice. Okay, And you heard my colleague state that there will be 
many open public hearings, and I will encourage that. He also said once it is completed with that subcommittee, then it goes to the Board of Public Works and whatever they do there. I mean, they're probably going to be setting the fee. Won't you, Ned, at that point? Will you be setting the fee? I don't fee? believe it's in our task to set the fee. I believe it would be what is sitting in City Council. Will be who? City Council, I would assume. Maybe the Board. I don't, I'm not sure which way. As you to find. City but, Council doesn't set the fee. But anyways, after it finishes the Board of Public Works, then what their recommendation is comes to City Council. And my colleague did state that we will have many open public hearings. Because as a counselor, I am getting calls of people not even knowing yes. about this committee. Uh, that's excellent information. Thank you for sharing. Thank you. Well, one of the ironies here, Mr. Walker, of our charge is what we're asked to do is to set a formula. It's a proposed a formula, which will go through a lo much longer process than we propose it. We don't even know how much money it's going to be used to raise. And that's not in our charge. We are curious. They tell us it has to be done. I believe it's true. But we don't know whether it's going to be half a million dollars a year or two million dollars a year. And that's not in our charge. That's above our pay grade. So all we've got to do is to figure out a fair and transparent, suggest a fair and transparent formula to <coughs> the people above us, and then the numbers will get finalized by a whole different process than we're in here now. There's a huge backlog of work that has to be done, and a little of it is EPA related, but not much. So, um, but that, you, I'm glad you're here now, which means you'll be really fired up, which just gets hot. But our charge is not even to know how much money is going to be raised. I think that's wrong. <laughs> well, I know, I know there's disagreement on in the subcommittee about how much money would be okay. And that's not our charge. We spent a fair amount of our first meeting actually at discussing that at length. And so it's a, it's a good point and I you know, respect that you're bringing that on. But given the charge, we have to assume that there's going to be a number that's going to be a reasonable estimate based on some scientific and engineering studies that will occur. The DPW has provided us with a basic ballpark framework of dollars, but it has a potential wide variation to it. We really just need to, to stay focused on whatever that number is, what should the formula be, and with that potentially, do we recommend a cap so that there is a limit to how much the city can bank. Yeah, exactly. And that will be part of the discussion. Or any well. cap that any one person would pay. Yes. Many. Oh, I was at yeah. You need to cap on the fee. There's yeah. been ten thousand dollars. Many whatever communities have had caps mm -hmm. for individual you know, payers, whether it's residential or or commercial, the maximum amount that they'll pay, as well as a minimum. So I think that needs to be part, I mean, that is all part of this formula of what is fair and equitable. Mm -hmm. Jim, do you want to go into some? How much of your discussions are going to use the CDM report as a basis to calculate these rates? Because some of the numbers in there are starting. None. Yeah. None? No, I'm not using that report. Oh. We're not calculating the rates. <clears throat> it's hard to get that, but it's truly, we are calculating a, a formula. The budget set up, it's, it's no different there. This is no different than normal budget process. DPW comes with its budget, police department comes with a budget. It's a political document. There's a huge amount of discussion and uh, that goes on between city council, mayor, and the city at large. And eventually money is appropriated of the total budget. Uh, and in that process, I'm assuming that stormwater will be broken out DPW will say, this is what we think we need, and the city council and the mayor will say yes or no, or some figure in between. But as we said a number of times, it's not, we're not going to calculate a fee. We're not going to calculate an amount. It's not our job to, uh, to look at the, at the Board of Public Works uh, requirements, which we don't have the skills or the time to do that and do what we're asked to do. But we do keep coming back to that. 
So we're all we're all keep coming back to you to your comment and suggestion internally. It's going to be a constant reminder to ourselves to not go there. Um, what will our final kind of product be that we're that we're going to present if it's not if we're if we're uh, creating a formula? I suppose we just plug in whatever numbers that we need at the end, say there's a, a single residential unit times three for whatever. <clears throat> so when we when we recommend something to the committee, what is that actually going to look like if it's not, you know, given, if we don't fill in some of those numbers? Jim? Um, I just wanted to say that um, you have to have some sense of what the revenue requirement is in the discussion. I agree with everything everyone's been saying, Alex and others, that um, you know, it's sort of a formula, it's not the actual rate or the bill that, that the task force is going to be working on. But in terms of uh, Dan's discussion in introduction of the concept of a cap, um, the use of a cap would shift um, potential revenue needs from one customer class to another. So you need to be aware of basically what the order of magnitude revenue need is for the city and how it would fit within the formula that you have, particularly if you have caps and you have uh, credits to the system. So you, you, you don't need to get down to the last dollar, but you do need to have an understanding of, of all the different factors. Could you remind us again what that ballpark number is? It's about uh, $2 million uh, each year. It's how much? $2 million, $2 million a year. Rick, I think what our final, I hope, what our final recommendation is we will have a formula we have all agreed is the best, fairest, and most transparent formula to make this calculation that we can recommend to the city council, which is just plain X property pays it's fine. the whole formula. Yeah. But where you just fill in the blanks with your particular piece of property. Because I, I think Chris was right. I mean, we can go around in circles a lot mm -hmm. if we don't just identify some number <coughs> and then, you know. I'm just afraid we're going to get mired down in yep. things that, that we really don't have any control mm -hmm. over until we step away from this committee and become a regular citizen and we can participate in whatever way we want in our opinions about whether we need to do this or, you know, all these political questions. Yep. So I, I just I just worry that we're spinning our tires yep. until we nail down a number and then back that number out and the number of houses and blah, blah, blah. You know, we could go round and round about this whole thing. And there's, <clears throat> Jimmy's talking $2 million a year. Uh, how, do you, how do you get that $2 million a year? That's what we're here to find out. You know, one of the things that's always intrigued me is they set up the uh, CPA. And, uh, you know, that, the amount of work that that committee has done over the last several years has been phenomenal. Uh, I'd like to take a good hard look at at how much money they raised with their 3%. And they can't go up on the fee. The only way that the fee can be changed, it has to go to the taxpayer. If we did something similar to that with some sort of a caveat on how we charge it out, uh, that to me would be the way to go. I don't think that uh, that we should be recommending that something that is set up that can go up every year. Uh, that that's a no no to me. Right. Uh, so and, and I think we can bring in two of the you know of the CGI. You yeah. know, uh, that's if that's what we want to bring in, we should bring that in. I I, I haven't. Uh, given this a lot of thought because I've been away. But today I read the minutes of the last couple of meetings and, uh, uh, and I thought about, you know, I, I, I tomorrow will research how much money the CPA has raised since they started and take a look at the projects that they have accomplished and see if something similar to that might fit what we're looking for. Because, believe me, uh, we're not looking at 
stormwater treatment, Bob, uh, we're looking at infrastructure here. Uh, and, um, uh, and, and there is a need. I've had 42 years with the sewer division. And in my time as superintendent, the, the budget for stormwater was $32,000 a year. Well, many years that just took care of the, the maintenance of what was happening, the emergencies. If we wanted to do a project and we didn't spend the whole of that $32,000, we saved it until next year. We saved up for three or four or five years before we could do a project of any size. And the, what's happened is the infrastructure has come down around our ears. And there's major things to do now. And we have to find a way. I agree with your theory on the CPA, with the exception of a couple of their projects. Well, we've got a twenty million dollar baseball complex. Can you, nobody I'd like wants to, not, to treat the youth about, better. Well, I'd like to not get into that. But that's in a floodplain. We need to, to stay but focused me, on our, our our charge tonight, which is the stormwater utility. I, I hate to interrupt you, but that would be a great discussion after the meeting. Well, I was saying that a fee similar to the CPA on an ongoing thing is going to be in competition with a two and a half or override, which will be the same thing. But we need them both. <laughs> we need them yeah. both. Yeah. Yes, sir. Uh, Fred Zimrock, Ward 3. I'd like to sort of add something to what Rick said. Uh, basically, what you're going to do is calculate some sort of formula in order to provide two million dollars a year, or three million, or four million dollars a year, assessed to businesses, to homes, to residents, depending upon whether they have a sewer on their street, and whatever else. And when you finish that, what I would like you to do is to provide a deliverable, and that is a document in which you plug in some typical numbers and show what the rates are going to be and what they're going to be for credits. So when you're finished, I'll have an idea what I'm going to have to pay if right. what your formula does work. So that's a written deliverable that everybody can look at. Sure, and we'll do that with the budget that the DPW has provided. You know, using a two million dollar rough number, we'll go through all that, look at what the different, you know, because my hope is that we'll have several alternatives at some point to consider and potentially come out with a final. And my expectation, Fred, is that I hope we have two or three different models of formulas. And Jim has said that he would have the DPW run the numbers for a couple dozen properties for each of those formulas. And I'll check. So you'd have ways you can compare <laughs> before, just until we can decide, because we don't know. So would we recommend more than one? No. Did we run some? Have Jim run some numbers? We can look at it and then come up with them. Well, since we're doing that work, looking at those formulas, wouldn't we want to provide that to the city council? So that they, no, that it's the final one. Final the one. final one. Absolutely. We'll, we'll figure out one. But not, we the, like the, not best. the just the one. Not the first. Well, I, but we, I don't we know might. if we want to get that far ahead. I, there, there may be a value to presenting them with more than one. It could be. Could be. Yeah. But yeah. I think you're right. But we really do want to see the real implications for this. And then once it's set up in place, I hope the city will do a huge public education effort to let people know. We're going to get billed for their strong water and about what their bill is going to be and what's the calculated. Education hasn't worked yet. I, 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 hope, I hope that the one thing we have to do. The challenge is going to be coming up with the formula. Yeah. And I, I would like to let Jim do some discussion on what other towns have done, their formulas, and then from there I think we can maybe start a discussion about what's fair and equitable here in Northampton. So, excuse me, Jim. Yes. Can I ask some question? Uh, to the public's concern is that we have a charge here, which I don't think we're all in agreement with or we're understanding because we're struggling. <clears throat> and well, how I read this charge, I read it in three parts. Not to belabor the issue, but read to you. But the, the last charge is to offer recommendations about actual formulas. 
That's the third part. That's C. To Jim's point, Mr. Dostal said, CPA, whether it's the CPA or the DBA or the D, whatever those things are, is that to our first charge is to examine ways in which these costs could be funded. So right at the beginning, at the outset, why are we talking, keep talking about funding when we should be talking about ways we can examine how these costs can be funded? That's charge number one as I read this. Then looking at what other communities, as you're talking with Jim about, what they have done, and then our own enterprise fund. So if I read the charge as they, the city council approved it, I would be starting with, let's examine ways that costs could be funded, Step two, step three, step four, and then at the end, after I had done all of this legwork, then I would look at coming up with formulas. As Chris said, one formula, eight formulas, so then we could make a re recommendation. And then we have formally, informally vetted this process. So when the public sits in front of us, we get an A for effort, an A for content, and we could look at them and say, we did it all, this is what we came up with. If we just go to the funding, Let's put 0415 in and walk out and save ourselves a lot of time and the public a lot of aggravation. That's what I'd like to offer. So we potentially could go back to Terry's presentation on day one, which was really the uh, sort of the funding options. We had an override and a fee. And those were really sort of the two choices. Um, and you know, override had pros and cons, um, and I think that again, that discussion for us to talk about an override here. I mean, we're our charge is not to come and make a recommendation. Well, we should think the city should do an override. I think that's going to be the city's um, this you know decision. So really, the only place that we can collectively provide some value-added contribution is going to be on the, if it's a fee, this is how the fee would look. And so, I, 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 I hear what you're saying, I, I respect that that's, <coughs> I'm only reading yeah, it, it does, you know, the, it says to examine ways in which these costs could be funded looking at what other communities have done in our own enterprise fund system. And that was our next step, which was to have Jim go over what other communities have done is, and I think you have a sampling across across the state. I also handed out um, two things at the beginning. One was a chart, um, stormwater utilities and other communities, not the easiest to read, um, as well as selected research findings, which came out of the 2005 stormwater utility fees document from the New England Environmental Finance Center, which is actually also on the DPW website. Um, one of the things I, that I found very interesting on this, and I just wanted to mention, was uh, under general, the initial impetus for enacting stormwater fees was flood control. Um, and then it says now NIPTES requirements are an important driving factor. But these stormwater utilities have been around since the 70s. We're just looking at it now because the need is great. And with that, I'd like to turn it over to, uh, to Jim. Sure, I have a couple of handouts. Um, So I talked to, uh, to Emery before he left about um, what he wanted me to talk about. And he, was, he was clearly focused on you know, what's happening in New England, what's happening in Massachusetts. And I, I'm going to speak to that in a minute. But these handout, this handout that I just provided um, provides a little bit of framework that, uh, that Dan just touched on. The first, this is only going to take me a couple of minutes, but um, the first page is sort of a a dot map that shows all the different existing stormwater utilities across the country. So just sort of you get a sense what in the Midwest, 
sort of east coastal areas, Florida, uh, the northwest, and quite a few in California. And the next page um, shows uh, a detail of New England, and you can see there's different dots on here you won't see. Basically, there's um, the green dots, for those of you that, that got the handout, um, are utilities that are under feasibility study in those communities. Um, yellow dots are implementation underway for utilities, and the red dots are utilities that have been established. So you can see Chicopee in, in Western Mass, Chicopee and Westfield are shown, in Eastern Mass, Redding and Newton are shown, and there are others that are, that are being considered. Um, the next page, which is sort of this kind of a graph here, um, again, it's just a different way um, showing um, stormwater utilities within New England and the status of them, whether they've been established, implementation underway, or feasibility, or their study. So if you want to get a sense of you know, the size of the communities that are working in utilities and how we shape up, we actually fall on this, uh, we fall on this chart over to the right, about six or seven um, bars down. So there's a fair number of, of these utilities that are for communities with population under 40,000. So it's a tool being used in New England by other communities that are similar uh, in size population-wise to Northampton. Um, the, last, the last page here, which is just in black and white, um, I, I copied this afternoon and I thought it would be, would be interesting to see this. This is a, a summary of the number of utilities across the country by year. And as Dan had just indicated, utilities really started in the mid-70s. Uh, there were a few of them, just a handful of them across the country. And then the real, really the first peak in utilities um, occurred in the early 90s after Hurricane Andrew and um, significant Connecticut, uh, Mississippi River flooding um, in the Midwest in 1993. Those of you that can recall back at that time, there was a lot of flooding. Um, and a lot of utilities for flood control came out of those storms. As you continue to look further over on the right on this graph, in 2003 when the NPDES, the phase two rule came out, which is the, um, the new permit that we're talking about is an upgrade to that, to that permit that first came out in 2003, there was a, a significant increase in the number of utilities that were formed to, uh, by communities to help deal with compliance issues related to stormwater. And then I think one other thing that, um, I got these slides from AMEC, which is a consulting firm, one thing that I, that I added myself to this, and I don't think I wrote it on there, but in 2005, when Hurricane Katrina hit, the Army Corps really changed the ways that they um, inspected and how closely they looked at flood control and the obligations of communities to maintain those. We, we, our sense is that they really ramped up um, obligations for communities that are responsible for flood control um, to take a more active interest in maintaining that infrastructure because of the disasters that happened because of Katrina. So if you look at 2005, again, there was a pretty high number of new utilities formed right after Katrina and then through the late 2000s. Um, I think it's an indication of uh, nationally what some of the drivers have been for communities to look at utilities. So I wanted to, to, uh, to get back to New England um, so Emery will know that I did my job when he wasn't here um, and talk about some of these utilities that have been set up. Basically what I've done is I have, I have got a few notes that I'm going to walk through um, people here. We had sent out, um, I don't know, a week or so ago, a, a link to summaries of utilities and all these documents that are on the website. It's kind of, there's voluminous information up there and I can appreciate people trying to fight their way through that and figure out what, uh, what's been written about some of these things. But um, when I look at the utilities across New England, um, the things that I find interesting um, in regard to their applicability to Northampton are the questions, um, what are the regulatory drivers for those communities? What are the political drivers for the communities? What were the revenue needs? Um, what were their data management capabilities at the time they set up their utility? And then what was their overall schedule in terms of needing to do funding for whatever their, uh, whatever their community's obligations were? So you'll see some common themes, and I'm just going to walk through um, about, about eight, eight of these, which show up. I think most of them show up on this handout that Dan sent out earlier, which is a, uh, a table uh, from the CDM report, which is a summary of utilities in New England. So the first one, um, the town of Reading has a stormwater utility, a population of about 25,000. They set their utility up in, 
uh, the time frame 2003 to 2006. They set it up for uh, EPA stormwater MS4 permit compliance when the new permit came out. Also, they had flooding issues and uh, drainage system operation and maintenance issues that they were unable to fund through the, through the general fund adequately. They set up a fee structure with a flat fee for uh, one and two family homes. Other properties uh, receive the fee based on impervious area. Undeveloped property in Reading doesn't get a bill. Um, they do have some, uh, some credit allowances for certain things. Their budget, uh, I don't have up-to-date up budget information uh, for these communities. We didn't do that research, but um, back a few years ago, their budget was a little over half a million dollars from the utility. Um, the town of Reading still relies on general fund for some of their stormwater system costs. So they had decided as a community when they set up their utility that money in the general fund that went to stormwater related items would continue to go toward those items and then they looked at additional revenues that came from the utility to pay for things above and beyond um, what they could pay for with funding from the general fund. So it's kind of a hybrid thing that they did um, and it took them three years basically to implement it I think because they had a lot of, a lot of different discussion on what they could do. Do you know about what the <laughs> proportions are the general fund money compared to the I do, right? I don't. Okay. Um, the second utility that was that I want to talk about for a minute is uh, the city of Newton, population of about 85,000. They set their utility up um, to take care of stormwater infrastructure projects, uh, increased operation maintenance requirements for the drainage systems. They had an EPA administrative order uh, because of bacteria problems in the Charles River, and they also set it up to assist them with funding MS4 EPA stormwater um, compliance. They set their utility up in 2006. Um, they started with a simple fee system for ease of implementation. So um, they, they established a flat fee for residential unit, a flat fee for non-residential unit, and currently they're considering a change to a variable rate system based on impervious area um, to capture more equity in their, in their billing system and to increase their revenue uh, increase their revenue needs for the new MS4 permit requirement. <coughs> they do have some credit system allowances and they have some discounts for senior citizens. Their, uh, their budget, um, which is a couple of years old now, is $1.15 million a year that came out of uh, the utility. So they took, the, uh, they took the, uh, the flat fee approach. We can do this easy. We'll send everybody a bill. We don't have to worry about GIS or data management previous area calculations or anything like that. So that's, um, I think that's a, a common theme with some of the older utilities. They just decided to do something on a flat fee basis. Um, the third one, uh, City of Chicopee has a stormwater utility, population of about 55,000. Um, why did they do it? Um, to manage the stormwater systems, capital projects. Um, they do have credit incentives for large paved areas that uh, build on-site best management practices. Um, they also use some of the money to fund combined sewer overflow capital projects. Um, it was set up in 1998. They set up a flat fee for residential and a variable fee rate for multifamily and commercial. Um, they're considering right now a credit incentive program that would be added to the program. Um, their budget, um, the last I saw published, was one, about $1.5 million annually. The fourth uh, city, City of Fall River, population 89,000. Why did they do it? Um, capital projects for combined sewer overflows and sewer rate relief. Um, they were concerned about equity based on stormwater discharges from, from large private property. Um, stormwater utility was formed in 2008. They set up a flat fee system for um, residential properties, one through eight family units, and a variable rate system for commercial property. Um, their budget is about $4.6 million a year. Um, the fifth utility that I wanted to talk about is Westfield, population of about 41,000. They set up the utility in, in uh, 2010 um, to manage the operation and maintenance of the stormwater infrastructure and also for EPA and MS4 compliance. Um, they set up a flat fee for residential and a variable fee for non-residential with a cap. Um, with that calculation, the variable rate based on the previous area. Their budget is about $560,000 annually, 
and that revenue covers about half of the budget needs um, for the obligations for their stormwater infrastructure. Um, With the general fund doing the balance. That would, that would be the um, Let's see. South Burlington, Vermont. We'll go into Vermont here for, for a second. South Burlington has a pretty well established utility, uh, population of 16,000. They formed the utility in 2006 um, in order to address erosion issues, flooding, and stormwater management. Um, they set up a residential flat fee system and a variable rate system for non residential property. They do have a credit program. Their annual budget is about $1.125 million. Um, the last one I'll talk about uh, is Lewiston, Maine. They have a stormwater utility. Their population is of 42,000. They set it up in 2007 to deal with uh, EPA MS4 federal mandates, um, tax relief and equity, and to deal with operational cost and capital needs for stormwater related projects. Um, they set up a flat fee system for uh, residential with a separate fee for duplex units and a non-residential um, fee structure based on a base fee plus a variable rate based on the amount of impervious cover on the property. They do have a credit program. Uh, Lewiston's budget is about $2.2 million annually. So you get a sense, um, I ramble through those really quickly, but I think you can start to see common themes in terms of uh, the need for funding to deal with EPA and its four federal mandates or flood control or combined sewer overflow or some regulatory obligation that these communities needed to deal with that they were unable to find the revenue in the general fund to take care of those obligations. So I think it's, it's interesting. Every community story is different. If you delve into the stuff on the website and you look at each community, you can see why they decided to do it, what they did. Um, the city of Northampton, we're our own community. You can set up, uh, if, if you choose to set up a fee structure, there's a number of different ways to do it. I will say that when we get into those um, slightly more detailed discussions that we have a, the city has a lot of data that's available. You can do a fairly complicated rate structure, relatively easy. Some of these other communities did a sort of a base flat fee type of system because of ease of implementation. Uh, but you can, you can come up with a fee system that's equitable and you can calculate it without taking 100 years to do it. So. Thanks, Jim. I like that last line. <laughs> Any questions? Um, when you say that we're set up with all with a lot of data already, if we if we do choose a more complicated fee structure, um, would that save us? Um, as opposed to having a simple fee structure where we don't need all this engineering involved, what we do have now is that give us a leg up on, on on getting to a more complicated structure or because I'm, I'm sort of the idea of a, a simple structure really appeals to me because it takes some some work off of you guys. Oh, yeah. don't worry. <laughs> but I nobody know. else does. Is there a cost? I, I think there's a, a, is there a cost of getting a lot of all the data that you would, would we, the Are we already invested in that data? In other words, can we leverage that data to get a more complicated structure? Yeah, I think uh, we have. We do have a lot of data. Um, I think to do a, we had estimated about twenty-five thousand dollars would be necessary in order to calculate. This is an, as, as an example, impervious area coverage on all the commercial lots and condominium properties in the city. Um, but that's a one-time cost. Once it's done, you'd have your system set up. For residential units, if you were to take an average unit for single family, two family, three family, those numbers are easily achievable. We know what they are. You can implement them. Um, I think the, the important thing is that um, I know that the task force is concerned about equity. It's a word I've heard a lot. Um, that by using data, you can get to a more equitable solution rather than a flat fee. Yeah, it's um, less transparent. Um, well, it's, it can be more transparent. I think, you know, right. um, Fred raised a good question, and, you know, we've had discussions that we should, the, the, the formula should be something anybody can understand. If I get a bill at my house, mm -hmm. I should be opening up that bill and say, well, how come I get a bill for $20 this quarter? And I should know where that came from, and mm -hmm. everybody should understand where that came from. So, Alex? Hi. 
uh, just sort of basic conversation about equity. Right now, uh, residential property, according to your calculations, uh, produce, has about 47% of the impervious system surfaces in the city. It pays 80% of the stormwater fees. Commercial has about 30% of the impervious surface. It pays 20%. So already, we're in a city that's that's paying for stormwater in a rather, in a not an equitable system. If you take the impervious system, if you take the amount of runoff to be a, a you know, what the... You compared the tax take from the two sectors to the right. expense. This is a good time for me to hand out the large impervious data. <laughs> okay, I'm wondering. Oh, you're you're up to really high. Great. <laughs> Oh, good. Okay. There's no, there's no fees on this proposed or anything. Yeah, and this is only the, the data that Jim provided. But I would point out it's very unusual right now. Did I ask Jim a question? Please, Jim. As you went through those, I noticed there were four or five of those that you said were mandated by the EPA. I can't get this across to you strong enough. The EPA has overstepped their bounds on water pollution and water regulation. I see some of those. If I was a mayor of one of those cities, I'd have a lawyer tomorrow trying to recover the money that my people spent because you regulated something that I had to do. I think that's a very important point because the EPA is going to find themselves, as we go along forward, a lot of changes. I, I would like to respond. No, you guys no. want to respond to that? That's no, no. Well, I, think you, I think you're sliding to it earlier. There's, there, there's two parts to that. It's a, I had the exact same response when I saw that. When I dug a little deeper into the story, the water, there's a component for that community, the water itself, and I believe it was because of discoloration, was being called a pollutant. And that's what they took to task to the EPA. And the EPA overstepped their bound calling stormwater, the water, a pollutant. There are still pollutants in the stormwater. That community is not going to be able to have a, anybody rule that the EPA is overstepping their bounds on that, because that won't happen. So it's a good point. I think it's uh, when you read the initial headline in the article, it starts off with that. But the in-depth part of it is, is it's really what EPA was forcing this water issue as a pollutant. Water is not a pollutant, and that's what the state Supreme Court, I believe, said in regards to, to that particular case. But the MS4 permit, there are certain communities, because of their size, have already had to um, comply fully with the EPA regulations. And there is no, um, there will be no court cases, I think, for those communities, um, or could there have been, to not have to do that compliance. Terry. Um, I'd like to circle back to your questions earlier, David. The Board of Public Works and the Department of Public Works tried to start with an open mind about fees. And I, I just I don't want you to get stuck that like look we haven't dealt with charge one or charge two. Why are we talking about charge four? <clears throat> the issue is this, and then this in, in fact speaks to what Jim was talking about earlier with some kind of a CPA sort of approach to the funding. If you're comfortable saying that the house on Round Hill Road half an acre lot worth $800,000 ought to pay three times a house down in Bay State with a half an acre lot. If, you're, if that makes sense, then using the tax base continues to make sense. If it makes sense that Smith College or um, Cooley Dickinson or the churches, uh, if it makes sense that they should be allowed to opt out of the system and not contribute, then again, using the general fund makes sense. But I think you quickly realize that that doesn't work. 
and again, you may disagree, which, which is, you know, I'm, but so we quickly got to the point where we thought of some kind of a fee structure makes sense. Then everyone contributes. Everyone participates. It's a shared benefit, the flood control of stormwater discharging, and it's a sh it should be a shared expense. So if you get to that point, then it, it seems to me, again, it's just my opinion, that the first charge is quickly answered. Um, I, I just... You made the point, and I don't think anyone responded to it. I'm thinking I, agree, I appreciate you responding. That's exactly my point, because I, I feel I will get to that quickly, too. It's just that if the general public, if we're transparent, and John Q or Jane Q public stops me on the street and says, I read your charge, and there is nothing in the minutes about how you did things, you just went to part three, mm -hmm. then I haven't done it yet. And that's the only reason I brought it up. So I agree with you 100%. And I want to make sure that if we're transparent, you you have gotten to that because you've done the you have the background and the time to do it. This this group has not. And then if we're supposed to be transparent to to the public, then we haven't gotten to that point. Right. That shouldn't be in the charge though. Could could we ask Terry? <coughs> could you go through those numbers to see how you got to that conclusion? I mean, we don't see those. We don't know. I mean, the words you say are fine, but the numbers are really what we should be seeing. Wh which numbers are these? If I might well, he was talking about not having Smith College and the churches involved, and and the only way to do it is to do a general fund. So well, what were the numbers that, that draw you to that conclusion? Currently, the gen with the gen with property taxes alone fund the system. That's correct. And the churches do not pay property taxes. Smith College does not pay property tax. Cooley Dickinson does not pay property tax. And any nonprofits like the Smith Charities around the city, they do not pay property tax. So the money that the city is spending on stormwater is money that we raise without their help. And yet, you know, you just think about Smith College's campus or uh, Cooley Dickinson's grounds, of course they're contributing to stormwater runoff. Right. It's about 15%. 25%. 25%. 25% of the city does not contribute to property taxes. Okay. So, I, you know, how, much, how, how, much, how much do they contribute to stormwater? 25% more or less. 25% of the property in the city does not pay taxes, but all of the property in the city generates runoff. You know, more or less. And in some cases, more runoff because the type type of activity that they do leads them to have more semi impervious or you know, impervious material. I mean, you know, there's much more parking lot on the Smith campus than there is in my in my yard. So the new parking lots for Cooley Dick. Look what that causes down at the bottom of the high school field. Yeah. I'm very familiar with that. <laughs> <laughs> so if if we go back. So what David is suggesting is starting off our discussion of fair and equitable with that question. So what is, is fundamentally, what is the more equitable way for us to do this? Is it an override, some sort of a, you know, CPA type tax or a, uh, a utility? We should go through that process. First, I know. I think Terry presented that in day one, and the DPW's recommendation to us was that that was more fair. I agree with David that we should go through that process right now. Start there, make some progress. If we agree that that's the way to move forward, I think we can then go to step step two. Can I have a question? Yeah. It seemed like uh, the the list of properties that are exempt from property taxes isn't that large of a list. And I'm wondering if there's some, I know that um, <clears throat> the mayor has been asked questions about payments in lieu of taxes um, on nonprofits and Smith. I'm wondering if we could have some combination, this, I'm just throwing this idea out there, that if we did have um, something based on the tax, tax rate, the tax base, property taxes, if we then segmented the non-property tax paying 
you know, entities, could we, could we approach it that way as a payment in lieu of taxes? What, what, do you, what do you see as the advantages of that approach as opposed to a usage rate a la the water and sewer rates with which they already pay? A progressive. Okay. Oh, okay. Type All right. Yeah, gotcha. Okay. And naively, can we ask the nonprofits to pay? Is that, is that an, so an we avenue? We have at yes. times approached Smith College, for example, and they're rather uh, jealously protective of their prerogative not to pay taxes. <laughs> and, I, and I appreciate that, but as, what this, about ta as this task force, can we, are we allowed in, in our recommendations to say, we, we put down in our minutes that we ask that the nonprofits participate in our end formula? Surely we can. We, surely we can? Can, yes. Okay. And, the, and that we, someone may say no, or, or they, no, they, they may if, not, but if at we, least we ask. If we end up with a fee, they're going to have to do it. But if we come up with a formula that produces a number that would show them what they would pay under a fee, could we give that as a uh, payment in lieu of taxes and, and, and handle the rest of the, yeah. you know, the They might still have the prerogative, though. If it's not a fee, it's going to be a payment in lieu of. <laughs> no, well, that, that gets off the charge, though. Our, recommend, our recommendation to the city council would be that we want the nonprofits to participate. Well, that's, everybody. That's our rec yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. including including. That's yeah. our recommendation. That's what and an then that's what we recommend to the city council, and the city council sets that ship to sail. But yeah. at least we recommended right. that in our process that we, we we would like everyone, every property owner to participate. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I'm not. I'm just saying yeah. that. Is that's right. Yeah. Somebody want to make a motion? That we. <laughs> no. no. I, you know, have a long history of dealing, particularly with Smith College. Uh, they're, they're very, they're unwilling, and it said in writing to, to, uh, to set any kind of uh, payment in lieu of taxes. The only successful way of, of uh, dealing with Smith is to charge them as we do for water and sewer. They're just not willing to commit themselves. You know, in a, any given year, when you go to them and say we need. $300,000 for a new fire engine, they may well come up with it. But they'll never, uh, or at least never have so far, said we'll give you $50,000 a year for anything. Well, I know Brown University is dealing with Providence in this way right now. So, you know, I think that maybe times have changed enough that, you know, I always wondered where is Smith going to go. And, and it just seems to me we're facing a crisis in a way in the city. And, and we need to think of alternative ideas. That, that's all I, I'm suggesting. But if you look, I mean, the way it's set up now, it's not fair. I mean, just within the, the taxpayers, just within the city, residential property pays way much more than it should, and commercial property pays considerably less. There's no way of changing that unless you quantify what you're, the service that you're producing and and, and can put a charge on it. Uh, it's all legal and it's straightforward. Uh, if you're going to produce a fee, call it a fee. Don't call it in lieu of taxes. That has a different definition. Mm -hmm. And what we're doing is, is a fee here, and we want to call it a fee. I agree. And that way we go with, the, with, it, yeah. with everyone. I'd like to turn our attention back to this page here. And if people would look at the, at the category, we said percentage impervious area by classification. The residential is 31% of the total impervious area in the city. Commercial is 20% of the total impervious area in the city. Nonprofits and other educational stuff are 15%. Open land is 4 And the city itself is 30%. So that 30% skews off those other numbers. It means that the, it's really the 31 and the 20 and the 15 that we're going to have to pay, use to pay the fee. Does that make sense? When you do the initial comparison, you've got to take out that 30% at the bottom, which is the city. Why? I don't think you have to. Because it's part of the total property. It pays no tax. All I'm thinking is in the revenue part. But the, the city wouldn't pay for it. Does the city charge the enterprise fund a fee? Pays for its water. 
does the city charge the enterprise funds fees? Yes. So and we damn well can charge the city a fee. Okay. But so the point I'm making is that when you compare, as Alex was just doing, the tax paying proportions, they're not as different as it would seem from this chart because there's 45% which pay no taxes. Right. That's the only point I'm making. Okay, that's valid. Mm -hmm. And no, I, I agree it's still unfair. It's still unfair. <laughs> not quite as but unfair. Not, not just quite as fair. So is there a way to, to redistribute that on a way to So to me, to me fair of. means everybody pays for what they put into the system. Including the city. But if the, and if the city pays, pays, it, it, that'll it, be a tax, which will then, right? If the city pays, it'll have to come out of the general fund, which will have to then be made. Yeah, the city can fund it, share however you want. Fee. Mm -hmm. It's no, not only, a tax. It's a fee. It's a fee. It's a fee. It only, can only, the city can only pay its fee with a tax. Right. With yeah. the general well, fund I mean, fee. That's the part, part of this whole thing that's really yeah. just a shell game. It's, yeah. just, yeah. it's just the city moving money around. And, yeah. and, you know, we can argue whether they should pay. I mean, they pay water and sewer rates. They do it by re increasing our taxes. Should they pay water and sewer rates? Maybe you could probably make an argument that they shouldn't, and and stop moving the money around, and 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 get it to flow more literally. But if we're gonna if we're gonna institute a series of fees that operate like water and sewer, I think you'd be consistent in how you treat the city. Mm -hmm. That's a good point. Yeah. So you know it, it may be that we shouldn't treat the city that way, but that's a, that's a decision for another group of people to make. That you know. Um, at my other, at my other work, uh, <laughs> at my other office, <laughs> where Jim and I hang out way too much. Um, but, but for me, at this point, you know, if you're gonna if you're gonna charge them for water and sewer, you're gonna charge them for stormwater. And I don't know how you structure Absolutely. it, but you figure out a way to do it. You have to. Somebody, I, some, I think it was Dave said, we want every property owner to participate. I'm going to carry that to my grave. That 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 well, we can a solid add, goal. At least our we have to ask. Yeah, yeah. We're, we're, the city council is going to vote on this. Right. Yeah. But we're, right. our mission our, is to say I, I we the, want to ask. I think that I appreciate Alex. They made you know all that history, but we're going to ask as a task force. For me, the soul of the, uh, the soul of the solution, as I see it, has to embody that that That's that sentiment mandate. right there. Mandate for we, the we, we can't do that. <laughs> we're, we're not the city council. Yeah. No, but I so I would make a motion that we we ask every property owner to participate. to participate in whatever our formula is. I would make that motion. I would say as, that. As part of our getting, and that will move us one yep. one chip off the block. Absolutely. All in okay. favor? Aye. 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 Opposed. I'm opposed. I don't know what the right way is. And in the model I had before I came in here, the city didn't pay anything. They made up for that money another way. But the city itself didn't pay any money to the fund. So I'm trying to compensate for the street, the commons, by one part of my formula, and then you run off and you run off and you run off, you each pay. I think, I think so Dave, that, Dave's motion was that every property owner is going to participate. That's the way motion. That was the motion. I should have reread the motion. I'm still opposed. So yeah. should okay. my motion say every property owner except city-owned property? Well, I'm just I'm just asking I'm Bob if that's where. No, I I it, I may come around to the charge the city point of view. I may change my mind. Okay. I just don't want to say we're not going to say that's how it's going to be. So why don't why don't we just continue working the list of the fair and equitable? Okay. Save it so we can. Have the entire list be yeah. sort of the motion. So, but so still in the question there is whether or not you know. So every property owner will participate, but we're not clear whether the city, as a property yeah. owner, should or should not. Yeah. Yeah. You use the word participate. What about the city right? gardens? And then pays it. Yeah. Yeah. So getting back again to to equity. Should it be based on property value? No. I'm not prepared to go mm -hmm. into that right now as to how that should be based. I want to look at the CPA figures and uh, some of the other things, and, and I certainly will be able to make a decision by next meeting. Maybe Jim has some background on that. Yeah. Uh, yeah, you, you want the you want the city engineer to uh, wax poetic about the legalities of establishing uh, 
a uh, utility fee. But under the law for a, for utility, the idea is the basic idea is a fee for service, so <coughs> not based on the property value or some other value of that sort, assessed value of the property or something like that. It has to be based on lot area or impervious area or some other number that's sort of equatable to what the runoff and impact would be from a property onto this system. So I think staying further away from assessed value of property <coughs> and toward more gross area or impervious area or some other factors I think would be, would be um, more appropriate to comply with the law. Great. Jim, the cities that you told us about tonight that have the flat fees, do you know off the top of your head how they set those flat fees? Most commonly, they're based on the average area for a residential lot. So if it's a flat fee for a residential property, they'll look at the total number of residential properties in, in, this, in the community, the total area, and then just divide the two. So they get an average of all of one family, two family, or three family. And the flat fee that everybody pays is based on that. So it's an average okay. property size based on the real community. Average impervious. No, property size. Lot size. This is for residential. For residential. I thought okay. it was average impervious. Oh, I'm sorry. Okay. okay. But it could be some other factor. But it could be. But right. you're right. Average impervious is, uh, is common. That makes more sense. For and it's like 2,900 2900 square feet is my, what, one of the numbers that I remember. Somewhere in that two to 3,000 range, it seems to be where they fall for driveways and, you know, roof. Runoff. In Northampton, it's, it's right here, 3,670. That's the average. For a single family. Impervious. Right. And that's what's gone oh, yeah, into the the equivalent residential unit number that has come mm -hmm. up with either. all read the same stuff. I mean, and the objections to that, I, you know, I feel uh, at least I, you know, haven't, it's definitely a conversation, definitely an argument. I mean, should I pay uh, with my thousand square feet of impervious system the same as somebody with 6,000? Just because we both live in sing single family house, you've got to be parking lot, lots of cars and trucks and whatever. I, you know, I think uh, it's, it's something that would come up. There's a that intermediary of, of 600 to 2,000, 2,000 to 3,000. I mean, somewhere you can't do it. Uh, obviously, can't do it square foot by square foot. Uh, but it seems to be in ranges rather than. It's commonly I think the tiered. That, I think they call it a tiered approach, right. and that seems to be a pretty common way of doing it. Right, tiered. It would seem to me that, uh, uh, for Jim, are the numbers for impervious surface in the CDM the ones that are you using? We have numbers that are up, a little more up to date than the CDM numbers. So the, the report goes back to, you know, the, they're working on the report in 2011. Um, the numbers, you know, they're constantly being updated by the state or the assessor's office. So the numbers change a little bit, but I think what we have here is they're accurate for, uh, for discussion. So they're pretty much what the CDM report is. Pretty much. Yeah. If if you go on a sense of paying a fee for the amount of uh, impervious area you have in the lot, it seems that especially if the taxpayer knows about it in advance, it gives them an incentive to reduce the amount of impervious nature. I know that there's like a large area that the uh, Smith Hole cast that could be broken up, you know, in gravel. But it, it seems to me that that's a, a more equitable process than just doing a flat fee by the square footage. So these are both questions about how fine grained we would how fine grained we would make our flat fee for residential property. So those are both address that question. Right. Yes, but I 
But incentive, I mean, obviously, I, I hope that we can come up with a formula that, that allows incentive for exactly what yeah. you're saying, for people to well, change their ways. And one of the things that Jim mentioned in his reading through of the, uh, um, the, the various towns, and I saw it looking at the, the Westfield statute, is this discussion of credits. And I, I don't know yet how that works, but I, I plan to know that shortly. Um, because I think I think if I think it really will help us. Um, I think it will really help everybody sell this product and move it along if we can show that there are ways to mitigate, that not just not just for economic reasons, but it's also it's a smart thing to do. You know, it, it, you reduce the burden on the system, and it may be incremental. It may be it may not be that you can wash the problem away. Right. But um, but but people I think enjoy having the opportunity to participate in things like this. Which is why we sell, you know, composting things at the, at, at up on up on uh, at the re recycling center and, and, and rainwater containers and stuff like that. People do want to make a difference if we can if we can help them do that. Yeah, uh, I think that's perfect because when you brought up you know the the averaging, some of the Jim some of the projects uh, that have, are done now currently when they go for planning board approval don't you have stormwater mitigation in them? So, they, so, so people have people that have been doing construction or doing upgrades have had to do some stormwater mitigation. So, will they pay the same flat fee uh, or whatever fee is done? I guess that's a question for the task force. Okay, and add, add to that, if as Chris just pointed out and Alex pointed out, or any anyone just look at it, if if we're vetting this process and you have the opportunity to mitigate your stormwater for the social reasons. That that's where you're going to get the rest of the community invested because they're going to say this is for the greater good, and also as the public listens to this, we're we're going to have talked about the subject, and they're going to see that we we went through this process and that there are alternatives to just paying six hundred and fifty dollars a year. That if you do this this or this, the city's providing other ways that you can channel this rather than just pay ad infinitum. I think one thing about um, the planning board requirements for stormwater mitigation on, on new development projects is that um, these things are required. So the question for the task force to think about is, yes, someone comes into town and builds a building and they build a detention basin or some other um, type of stormwater system, should they get a credit to their bill for stormwater by complying with the planning board requirement? or? If they did something above and beyond what was required by the regulation, <coughs> would then that be, be suitable yeah. for a credit? Mm -hmm. I don't really know. It's just something that right. you need to think about. Do you see uh, mitigation things that could be expanded on that they just hit a limit and then they, when they develop these problems? Yeah, I, I think there's always an option to do a little bit more. I mean, some sites are so tight that it might be impractical or too expensive. But yeah, that's a good they, point. If they've already done something to meet your requirements. They shouldn't really be given credit for that, you know, Not after the fact. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I think it's important to keep in mind, though, that the stormwater is still only the small part of this. And people right. keeping stormwater on their property, the flood control, it doesn't really matter if somebody has a detention basin, <laughs> they still will flood. And we still, and that is really where the bulk of the money is. So I think the opportunity for people to get some credit is yeah, sure. really important but keeping in mind that that credit is still going to be a small portion okay. of the fee there's really no way i think you know even if yeah. you know somebody comes on and says, i have all my storm water it stays on my site Bone that's dry. not true on that hundred year flood you're not going to be agreed but I, I also know that the amount that i compost isn't solving the landfill problem right you know so right. but i still do it you know mm -hmm. There's, right. there's there's two ways to be flooded. Flooded from within the city and flooded from outside the city in. And flood control station and the dikes take care of the Connecticut River. That that's on the inside, uh, all of that flood mitigation that they do, the storm control, uh, helps uh, that we don't get the amount of water down to the flood control station that has to be pumped out. And my, my experience right. is that control the yeah. control the runoff. Sure, I, I'm sure Jim would agree. Every drop matters too. Yeah. Yeah. Every single drop. 
you got the three pumps down there going full storm. I just thank you for the dialogue because now I can tell the public this information that I wouldn't have been able to tell them before. Because now I have some facts to back it up. And the DPW does have a program where if you have detention based on, on your property, you have to have it maintained, you have to inspect it periodically and then certify it's being maintained. So I would have no problem with giving people who do that a credit of some sort. I don't know how big it should be, but they should get a credit for, for doing that because it's a real incentive for them to do it that we appreciate. Well, we have to figure out the criteria around that and how to enforce or certify. Or no, you do it. That's all done. We just <coughs> say the DPW. It's our recommendation. Yeah, what the, the the credit, credit. Like what the credit is, how would it be done? How we might. We'll never be done if we have to come up with <laughs> <Not> right. right. <laughs> is, is that an onerous thing for the city? Ned to go out and make sure everybody's credits are. There's a lot are... of work. There's a, there's a lot of detention facilities across the community at this point with only a few of them maintaining them that we're aware of. And so those people would get credits. The people who don't have them kept <coughs> up. Too bad. Sir? <clears throat> I, I think a practical way to approach the whole thing about credits is to at some point in your deliberations maybe assign a percentage of potential credits, like there might be 10% of credits that could be figured out. I think we could safely leave that to Jim and Ned to work out the details of that. Um, I think, it, as you say, Dan, it, it'd be, we'll never leave if we're getting down to the level of what the slope of the detention pond ought to be and how often we need to mow the lawn. And, you know, <laughs> But if, you know, if, if as a, just a general principle, we were experimenting with the idea that there could be potentially up to 10% mitigation of your bill with some kind of work on your property, right. <clears throat> that, that gives the staff enough room to uh, calculate how if the fees might spread out. Right. And it would have to be very well defined. And I'm thinking about pavement. And you know, if you rip up your pavement or you have more runoff, it's actually worse. It's still a hard pack surface that no longer has a protection on it. You actually get more runoff, more solids. It's actually ends up that's, being that's that right? actually something that I can see happening. I've had several people in my neighborhood uh, say, "Oh yeah, if this if this happens, then they can get, you know, a cost reduction. They're going to do it." Yeah. So that will be part of the educational process to make sure that people are aware that that's really not going to help. Well, I got to tell you. We were thinking about it. I'm out of work. My husband's out of work. If it'll cut my cost, we were thinking about it. <laughs> so. Some of the city <laughs> streets are going in bad. <laughs> That's true. Um, I wanted to mention Westfield. I went to the Westfield site. Emery sent me a link, and they have a page of credits. We might just, instead of trying to figure out what could be credits, we might just want to look at some of these other sites and pull what they've got listed for credits, not even you know, just say, well, this looks good, this looks good. And then give them to Jim and Ned and let them figure out, you know, I'll bring, if, if they're. I'll print out for next week. You know, rather than trying to figure them out ourselves, yeah. let, they've already done the work, let's just, there's you know. A few, there's a few different credit manuals that are out there. You'll see if you're crazy insomniac and you can go on the internet and look at all these things. <laughs> but um, so Arlington has a credit manual. City of Philadelphia has one. Um, I think we may have one. Newton has a. Newton is kind of interesting because they have sort of a short form of credits that's easy to work with. Um, you can take a look at that. Um, it, it seems like I'm not sure there's a universal approach on it, but uh, um, I think Dan made a good point about the credit and the flood control costs, and, and Terry as well about you know maybe just set sort of a percentage and then we can work up with the US to, to work within that <coughs> constraint. Jim, I wasn't clear when you when you're talking if it if it had to have stormwater mitigation for planning board approval. So that is not a credit. That that because it's the legal uh, effect to the construction or the re reconstruction. So so then there's still that that parcel will still be charged the same as a parcel that has been in existence. That's really up to you. I, I just was introducing the concept that if, if a property owner is obligated to do something under a regulation right. and they do that, do they get the credit? Okay. And I think, I in, I think in many know. cases it's easy for the DPW to do, which is give people credit for keeping their systems functioning. I wish I didn't have many credits, I don't think, but that's an important thing. Mm -hmm. I'll do it the other way. Sorry? Did 
if, if yeah. I could just uh, throw in my two cents about that. If uh, a new car dealer is building a lot and is required to put in detention, detention ponds, and the older car dealer across the street doesn't have those and decides to put them in, and he gets a credit, it doesn't seem fair. If someone has a drainage mitigation um, feature that would normally re uh, create a credit, then I think regardless of how it got there, right. it, it, you have to keep it fair. They can apply. Right. Yeah. yeah. Well, you could give a one-time credit for somebody who read it and came back and fixed the pre-existing. Well, I think the difference is mandatory versus something that you're obligated to do. That, yeah. That's the difference there. Yeah, but if you, have, if you have the feature that would qualify for credit for the guy across the street, and he's getting a discount every year, I think what Jim's saying is that guy would have to do it. Your thing costs money too. This is still the small part of it. It is. Yeah, right? It's a tiny detail. Yeah. 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 But it's a, it's a discussion that yeah. you know, we're going to have at some point. It's, yeah. it's intriguing. It's not a, you know, there's no, it's, I think it's a good thing to, <clears throat> there's some juice here to maybe flush this out a little bit. So so the whole, the credit issue, you know, if, there, if the auto dealer has to do it, but 10 years ago, somebody else didn't have to do it, and they go ahead and do it, they would get a credit, and, and the person putting something in now would not? That doesn't make sense. That, that, doesn't make, that would not make sense, right? Yeah. Okay. So even if it's required for zoning and planning, it would still potentially be accreditable, because we're looking at that as reducing the cost for the city, for the maintenance level. I didn't, uh, you were saying that if it's, it's a planning board requirement or a city requirement that they have these detention ponds, that it would be uh, potentially... It could be. It could be. I mean, that's, it's up to, I think, potentially up to us to, to make that recommendation. We agree on the idea of credit. We need to worry about the details yeah. of that. Yeah, and we don't need to worry about what the city's already requiring or not. If they happen to be requiring it for new development, then... So be it. Put we a caveat in there. You get a credit if you maintain it. Oh, it's got to be, yes. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. Let's talk about how we're going to proceed. Because if, if we're going to try to move quickly, forward quickly as we know we need to, we need to make some progress between our meetings. My suggestion is that any of us, singly or together, in there we're between now and our next meeting, to come up with some actual formulas that we propose be used. Now, we can't, unfortunately, distribute them prior to the meeting because of the open meeting law. But I think we should, if you've got an idea about a form that you think would work, write it down. Think about how it works, and then propose it. And when we all come next time, you can bring your cop copies of it, and we can talk about actual specific proposals instead of... Maybe, maybe, yes. I wish Mary Ann was here because she's the expert on this, but... My understanding on the open meeting law is that you can distribute materials via email as long as it goes to everybody. You can't discuss it. There can't be any discussion of it, but you can, you can distribute them in advance. That's why uh, I hope was the case, Chris, but I just talked. So. That's okay. So, uh, All right. Clerk, and she next, said, no. if it's a recommendation or a suggestion, wow. that expresses your opinion. So if it's a matter of, was a document you're supposed to approve, Documents for a meeting, you can send that out, but you can't recommend something. Wow. All right. So you got we got to bring copies out and get prepared to talk about them next time. We can't distribute them prior. I think that's not what I told you. Now. <laughs> Do anyway, you think differently? I'm happy. No, 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 It'd be no, a no. lot easier if we could get it, we yeah. take a look at it. I think if people want to submit things to me and I distribute them to the task force without any deliberation so you can look at the stuff before the meeting, it becomes part of the public record, then you have a chance to look at it before you get together. I don't think there's anything wrong with that in terms of complying with public Can we right. confirm that? Can you? I'm pretty sure, I mean, we can confirm that, but that's, that's my understanding. As long as you don't deliberate, dissemination of information to a group is fine, but if, if Bob sends you an email, Dan, you can't reply to him saying, that's a great idea, right? Or, geez, that's the worst thing ever. No deliberations in email. Distribution of information is fine. That information becomes part of the public record. 
with meeting nights and things. So, you know, I think it's, you know, it meets the, you know, meets the law requirement and all the information That's available right. for anybody yeah, to get the first seat. Alex. Uh, I would hope that periodically, either at this, well, at this meeting and in future ones, that at some point we see if we had come to consensus on, on, uh, on anything. Do we have? Do we have a consensus? I think we do. We we voted that every everybody uh, in the city should contribute to should participate in this. Mm -hmm. Except that we were unclear about whether the city oh, the city itself was should should itself. <laughs> okay, yes. so we don't quite have consensus. Do we have consensus that the um, well? Excuse me, but the motion was, will everybody pay? And the vote was six to one. Mm -hmm. that everybody should pay. And Bob was the one dissenting vote. He is not sure that they should. But that that's a legitimate motion that, some, that was passed. So I would, just to be fair, because I think mm -hmm. Bob brought up the, that suggestion, does everybody want to re-vote? We should re-vote. No stating that every property owner, including the city, would participate. Well, that's a motion. motion. Somehow, second. that's a motion. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. All opposed? Okay. <laughs> Thank you, Jim. So we got one. <laughs> I think we're all for the consensus will be some form of modest credit. Yeah. Well, Alex, Alex was saying something about consensus. Yeah, on that, or oh, Yes. Well, I wanted to know if we had a, if a perfect, if impermeable surface was going to be the kind of the basic chip of how we're going to measure. Hard not to. Yeah. I mean, that's what I think. But I'm, I'm asking, do we have consensus? Right? As opposed to like a, a equal right. unit. That that would be the I guess the alternative is sort of parcel. You own a you know one vote per parcel owner versus one vote per square foot. Right. You know, Terry? That's if I might suggest, the, I would encourage you to keep your, an open mind about a combination of square footage and impervious. As soon as you start saying uh, only impervious, so a farmer's field pays nothing? Yes. How does that work? Uh, I, I would encourage you not to lock yourselves in quite yet. I think Ultimately, you may find some advantages to having a combination of impervious surface and gross area. Yeah. You would suggest. I'd like to. Uh, I'm sorry. Suggest if you get this thing put together and you've got the obvious unanswered questions, let's put a half a page newspaper ad. At one time, when we were trying to bring a department store to this city to replace the McCallums which Floyd Andrews turned into a successful place. We ran a half-page newspaper ad. Do you want this? Do you, the fee might be this, the whole thing. Come up with a survey that you want. And in a half-page ad in the Daily Gazette, we got back 12%. And I think the circulation at that time was 28 to 30,000. We got back 12%. Now, these are a lot of people that don't have emails. They don't have computers but they can read the Gazette and mail this back to a mailbox. Yeah. You'd, have, you'd get a lot of participation from the community. This gentleman spoke about education. That's part of the education of this community. Very important. Yeah, that's, very, important. that's a very good suggestion. That yeah, is. And at, at, one, I mean, at some point, we want to have several suggestions to put out to get that kind of uh, outreach. Or you want to have just the basics. You know, sort of basic question, but it seems like at some point when we have some a few things hammered out here, and we're unsure, and we need some public uh, input, that may be the way, a great way to do it. You had said, why don't we put some formulas together, send them to Jim, then he can compile them, and then next week we can hammer them out, come out with a. a some suggestions that formulas that we think are good and then we can put those formulas maybe in the newspaper get some public opinion of those but why don't we take this week look at what we've got here we can all think about it and then get some formulas of what we think whether they're impervious whether they're yeah, land, whatever you want 
you know, take a little bit of time now that we've got all this information and digest it and think about it instead of just jumping right now and saying we're going to lock into impervious yeah. and get what we each think yeah. is the best way to go about it after a day or two and get it to Jim. And then next week we can actually sit down with what we all think of our best formulas and chew them out and then get to the point where we can put the best ones in the paper. And hopefully then the ones we agree on, Jim can run numbers with. Right. That's what we need to have to right. do. We have the most perfect formula in the world. We don't know how it's going to work. Though. Right, right. Well, the Jim, you sent this out as an Excel spreadsheet, correct? And is it available as an Excel spreadsheet on the DPW site? So you can actually. So we can play with it. So you can play with it if you're good with Excel. Right. Run some of the models yourself. Right. As well. Right. Yeah, send me the models. That'd be great. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm looking forward to seeing the models. <laughs> So that's we're, we're so are we we're aiming toward that two million kind of glossy number up in the yes. sky? So we can take this and our own yeah. ideas of what we want to do and see what we can come up with. And is the um, the list of example properties also Excel? That that would be great. So we don't have every property in in town that we can actually. Because one of the things. This is sort of an aggregated spreadsheet, and if you, I, I was playing around with the spreadsheet that had the example properties. Mm -hmm. You end up with, you know, who would get with a thirty-eight thousand dollar bill, for example, using a mm -hmm. per square foot um, rate of the uh, impervious surface. Yeah, mm -hmm. of three Annual. cents, three cents per square foot. It was shocking to see how big, and because we don't have, you know, I mean, we can use those to start talking about caps, right. and then but the caps and the impact of those caps on that $2 million is almost impossible to bear it out because we don't have all those numbers. Again, I'd like to, I'd like to get those numbers, or at least the concept of those numbers, out to the big rate payers uh, as soon as we can so that they can start budgeting these things so they can't ask for a delay uh, on that. I've read where that has been a problem with some of these utilities mm -hmm. where you where you lose the major rate payers at the beginning because they just find a way to not be able to budget that. I'm, I'm not gonna I'm not gonna discount what you just said, but I, I think it's also important I think there are times when we're timid about asking people who have a lot of money to pay a lot of money. <laughs> I don't think we should be timid about asking them. Here, here. We may have to negotiate something, and that may be something we want to talk about with regard to caps, but people who make a lot of money, I mean, they pay bills, and uh, we shouldn't, it, it, it can be to scale. I agree with both of those comments, but in terms of transparency, it's only fair regardless of the size of the pocketbook if there's enough advanced knowledge. Oh, yeah. Okay, and so Paul's point about the Gazette, uh, if the DPW or the BTPBW is going to be the billing agency eventually, which I don't know if that's the case, but why wouldn't uh, when the next round or the next two or three rounds of water and sewer bills go out, that there isn't some type of a flyer in there yeah, exactly. where the bill payer, whoever they are, gets notice of what's going on here. I don't know who's going to pay for this, who's going to stuff it, there's the devils in the details. Yeah. If we want to be transparent and tell everybody the place to tell them is not on the internet, not in the Gazette, but when they open the That's bill. a great That's idea. idea. Yeah. Yeah. I, think, I think we just have to be careful about how we word that. Understood. I don't know. I'm, I, I'm with you. I don't know what you're going to put in it. No, but Help! Headline. Yeah. 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 Look at it. Comes, but that is, the, that, is, that, is the, that is to the point of uh, where some, everyone is going to get that. So whether they throw it in or not, we can at least say we've sent this out three or four times or whatever and you paid your bill, you got it. Sure, I, think, I think it's a great idea. Like that. I think, yeah, that's great. That. But I don't know. I'm not, tell, I won't be over licking envelopes and stamping stamps. That makes sense. <laughs> that, the only issue with that is there's a lot of banks that receive the tax bills from the communities that don't directly go to the homeowners, so the homeowner might never see that to put in the tax bill. Understood. I think he's saying water and water sewer. Water sewer. Yeah. Gets water and sewer. Yeah, understood, but I, I don't know. I, I just, I don't know. But something that, that to, you know, it's not the size of the pocketbook. It's that we have told people the educational part, which we've talked about the training, 
that we have to find ways to get to the most. We're not going to get everybody. Right. Right. It goes to the dead person. Yeah. But we're going to try to at least say we tried to get to as many people as possible. Do that. Jim? I like the idea, you know, the, the idea of bill stuffing is, you know, something that's pretty easily done. The only issue is that we don't build the city, we don't build the entire city at the same time. So there's sort of a timing and okay. scheduling yeah. issue. Yeah. Understood. If, if you wanted to hit everybody to get a water and sewer bill, it would take, you know, I don't know how long it would take. Take four months. Take, take four months yeah. to do it. So um, you could do a bulk mail on your, but I, I hear what you're saying. Devil's the details. Yep. Figure it out. Yep. Get yep. the word out. Yep. Yeah. Getting the word out. I just wanted to answer Terry's point about the impervious and pervious surface. Most of the time, pervious surface is part of the solution. Only, you know, when you get seven inches of rain in 24 hours, then everybody's mm. the problem. But most of the time, farmland is part of the, part of the solution. Uh, environmental land, you know, open space in general <clears throat> is absorbing rainfall. Yeah, if it's not winter. True, <laughs> it's not frozen, it's true. But, I, yeah, yeah, it's a, and, and there are opportunities there. I, I mean, Bob has uh, spoken, I know, with some of you about the fact that 30% of the impervious area in the city is city property. Maybe using gross property area is a place where that can be addressed. I mean, you know, you're thinking there could be layers to this. Are you talking about absorbed into the other 70%? Well, let's, let's say, for example, that... It's just hypothetically, yeah, yeah. but let's say for a moment that you think that the city property should be a, a shared expense across the city. Is it property or roadway? That's the road, the road, all the improvements, okay. the buildings, parking. Oh, it's roads. everything. It's yeah, not just roadway. Right. Okay. But the but the roads. That's a yeah. big part of it. It's thirty percent. Just for the numbers. Thirty percent right. is. It says roadway, right of way. So if so I, maybe if I just clarify that includes Mass DOT highway, um, ninety one, um, non city. Is there a point well, that that was so, the, so maybe you address that. But if that was broken area. out and it was just the roads, everyone, the common good uh, profits or, or yeah. Yeah. gets it's, the use of that. So, so maybe it's that part goes by gross area. Right. And then some, the next some layer is exactly. impervious. Yep. And, you know, you build up a, a little stack of yeah. parts in your bill. The roadways are for the greater good. And so that has to be apportioned. Even the farmer, the other yeah. 70 yeah, even the farmer benefits, benefits, from, even the farmer yeah. benefits yeah. from that. That's yeah. a greater good. Yeah. So would that, so would it be fair to do that on a gross area? It's it's an approach. Well, it's just, it, this is a, a good place maybe to, to again because there's so many. Every one of these layers has so many variables to it. Or maybe this is a good place. Let's start with the commons. And how would we just, you know, if we were to build the commons across the community, how would how we do, do that? that? Yeah. We do it, you know, by, you know, per owner of a property. Everybody sort of shares equally. And, and if you're a property owner, you pay your one twenty thousandth of a, you know, of the total amount. Because I think, you know, the, then in that case, farmers end up, you know, using the, the total area. They end up getting. Really hammered. <laughs> <laughs> Although it is a small, it's a smaller amount. It's only thirty percent of the, the whole pie. Um, can I ask a Jim technical question? Talking about average area for residences and average impervious areas and all that sort of thing. One thing that comes to mind is you have. Can you calculate, say, a standard deviation on those averages to get an idea, of, you know, what the spread is. So the average is maybe, say, a thousand feet, but the properties vary from 10 square feet to 20,000 square feet. So using an average in that case where the deviation is large, you know, yeah. somebody's going to get stung. And that's where a tiered system would be fairer. Right. So do you have a number, a standard deviation or something that tells you on these, how that's a good question. I don't know if we can manipulate the uh, that's what I thought. the data to do that because we can get the total area for the residential layer, but getting the, getting any statistical information, the median or anything, uh, I'm not sure if we can manipulate that state data in that way. What about um? I mean, the majority of this may not be entirely true. A good percentage. Is going to be the house. You have the surface area, the square footage of the house plan view. That's 
that's a starting point for, you know, I mean, driveways are going to be all, they're going to be all over the place, and that's going to probably be a, a 30 percent at least. But that might be a way to at least start to look at the range. Yeah, I think, um, you know, it's a bear if you start to look at every parcel in the state and try to figure it out. Um, Alex had touched on the concept of a tier grade system, it could be based on gross area. Some communities have done that to try to capture the equity of the things that you're talking about here. Um, you know, a small lot would be a, a small black bean. Come up with some tiered system to try to capture that in a reasonable way without having to return. Right. So you don't have the square area of each piece of property in the city? You must have. We do. Total area. We just we don't have total area we, we don't have a purpose, so we can do it by total area. Oh. That's the way I'm being billed on my taxes. Jim, you, you said it would cost about 25000 to calculate the uh, commercial, yeah. um, doing the data gathering. Commercial and non-profit. Right. right. What, what, now, the, the rest would be uh, a much bigger job, I would imagine. Each property, polygons, all that. How close are we to knowing those numbers? What would it take for us to know each impervious surface? Five times as many residential. Ten times. I mean, it could be a yeah. hundred grand or yeah, something. Yeah, that's what I heard. It would be a big number. And I think the other, the reason other communities don't go to that level of detail is, I think the the variation that people would see in their bill based on like a really super detailed analysis is not a lot. Right. So I think other communities have come to the conclusion that sort of an average or a tiered system. One of those ways is a fairly reasonable way of coming up with an equitable bill for a homeowner. Yeah. I mean, when I looked at my property, you were off the factory too. So I mean, I take a fifty percent cut in what you're charging the CDM rate. I can argue about that. You sure you measured it right? Now? <laughs> 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 He's got a worksheet. You want to see it? <laughs> so I think we should set our next sure meeting, and then we should also talk about my proposal for the flex and full station tool. Mm -hmm. Yes. So next meeting, um, two weeks, Today. one week. What are, what I can't. Are we I'm going next week. I'm not here. I'm afraid you won't be on the sound for the next year. <laughs> <laughs> My brother is kept right along with it, but I'm happy to meet in a week. Two, two weeks, no more than two weeks. No more than two weeks. Yeah, mm -hmm. and we're looking to try to do something by early May. So we can't make it next year. If we're going to do it, yeah. I'm here. Everybody else? Next week is the 11th. 11th. The 11th. I'm in for surgery on the 11th. It may be tough for me. I may be late, but I'm yeah. talking about next week. Yeah. The 18th is the week school is off. If that makes a difference for anybody. School vacation. Yeah. 11th is Well, no. why don't next we. Week. Week. So the 18th, if we were to do the 18th, um, and in the next two weeks, individually or in smaller groups, we're going to try to, you know, I would say it would be homework for everybody to come back with a plan of some sort, a model. And no one to Jim. And, we'll, and, right, and if we can get up to Jim in advance, then we can actually be looking at each other's yeah. in it beforehand. So when we come to that meeting, it would be great if we actually had uh, review some of the work that was already done. And I don't think everybody has to do one. If people have some ideas about what is involved, they can write those down Absolutely. and say, here's what you created for me. Absolutely. Um, get to the gym. Yep. Get to the gym by Monday the 15th. So 18th, we'll try and do here again, 5.30. Is, is that what works for people? Yeah. Any other um, business that was not reasonably anticipated? Yeah, the cliff station. Cliff and cliff station. I think that's a great idea if we can get Jim Gospel to give the tour. Yeah. <laughs> well, I bet. Because he gives a great tour, I can tell you. I'm in for eye surgery on the 11th, okay. I don't know, you know how I'm going to recuperate. So I would say that to certainly get a good tour from John Carver down there at the pump control station. I would love to be there, and if I can be, I will be. 
but whatever you can set up down there. Well, the staff says the staff is surprisingly accommodating. Uh, and so my, we can do it on a weekend. The only person who I know is far to come on the weekend is John Chino. He lives so far away, but we can also do it at 4 or 5 o'clock any day, except for next week. Let's anybody in touch. Uh, it's going to work. It's going to work for you. Okay. Um, Anybody have a specific day they want to propose? Mm -hmm. Want to do a doodle poll or something, though? I, I think it's a good idea that okay. as many of us go at once. Okay. okay. Um, uh, yeah. Staff could also come in early morning meeting, 7 o'clock, 7.30. Okay. Do that. Yeah, that, that's preference for people. Yeah. For the tour, you mean? Do you, want, do you want to do a poll? Co coffee on it. I'll, I'll, so we can so we go there at 7 or 7.30 for an hour, right? Staff is there at 7. I could do that. That would be great. Okay, yeah, so early morning is pretty good for a lot of people, yeah. is that right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. All right, I'll be in touch. We're going to be gone next week, though. Yeah, so it's not going to be next week. No, not going to be next week. I'll, but I'll pull you before that. Cool. Any other new business? Do we want to continue using our remaining time to keep going on some of the Things we started with. Did we accomplish anything tonight? I think we did. Okay. Did you go through it? Yeah, just. Yes. Um, we had a motion. <laughs> <laughs> did, did you was first. Go, go through the chart. Did, did charge one take care of? Charge, that's a good one. Thank you. Um, we examined ways in which these costs could be funded looking at what other communities have done. I think we've started to do that. I'm not sure we're completely... It's a lot to look at. It's a lot to look at, but we've definitely made some progress there. Um, we've started on the recommending general principles, um, one of which we moved uh, and agreed that every property owner, including the city, should participate in this utility. And that's sort of where we... We landed. Yeah. And that square area is the an impervious surface will be a important measure. As will impervious total. Right. So right. And we also agreed that we're gonna have some modest incentives. And I yes. think we've yeah. redirected yeah. focus to yeah. what our task yeah. and we know we're gonna to try to make some real proposals for what we have for next time and, and hopefully we'll be a lot closer to Yeah, I think you're right. We've got a much more a little more focused, yeah. a lot more focused on what we have to do. Yeah. And it's legal for two or three of us to get together and work on a plan. As long as you don't talk to more than <laughs> five people. Uh, five people. Uh, Jim says no. Uh, no? You can't do that? No. Uh, we can't deliberate. No. no. We have to invite Fred if you're going to. Quar it's a quorum. <laughs> <laughs> you have to you invite Fred a, a group, a subcommittee, which is not a quorum of an elected body. Back when you were on the board, Bob, that was good. We just went through that with our budget meetings, with our small two to three person, four to five meetings, and they have to be posted. No such thing as a long form meeting. It's dangerous for me and Dave to be sitting in the same room. <laughs> yeah, everything's got to be posted now. Even a subcommittee meeting's got to be posted. Well, this is the Attorney General's opinion on the open meeting law that I took off the computer today. And it says, um, a communication among fewer than a quorum of the members of a public body will not be a deliberation unless there are multiple communications among the members of the public body that together constitute a quorum of the members. You can have less than a quorum work together, work out your ideas together. You just can't tell as much as a quorum. You, so you, you can plot and scheme all you want, come up with a really nasty formula, or you can do that and then send it to the gym. And that's not against the open meeting law. I you, suggest you want to talk to that you now? talk to the city solicitor. Okay, I, I, I talked to Mary. I, yeah. That is, that is the conversation we had with the city solicitor. Yes, and it was it was really chilly. 
yeah. as far as discussion goes. Yes. Really so he told, tell us what he said. So there is no non-quorum meeting. So then if we want to work together with somebody else who's on the committee, we can, you can post a meeting. Yeah. You have to have it in an accessible place. But doesn't mean you can't do it. Three of us could post a meeting and get together That's in a right. public yes. place. And yeah, have and have a discussion right. about what we thought would be a good system, just a good formula. formula. But for instance, for instance the tour, you would post that so the members of the public. Well, except we can't talk about anything that's no. part of our job, or this task of charge, on the tour. Okay. I'm going to invite the press, too. Bob, does posting mean that newspaper has to advertise it? No, it doesn't anymore. I mean, you've got to, the city puts it up on its website and posts a paper on in the first floor of City Hall, but there is no posting of the meeting. Like this, and we take a room. Ned, would that, sorry, uh, would that be okay? Bob mentioned about having the press come on that tour, uh, just so that we can publicize. Um, I don't have a problem with that. That meeting would not have to be posted because you are viewing something. You're not at, as long as you're not having discussions yeah. about the utility and looking at decision making. Problems. You're viewing something. We do this with private ways. We view the streets. Right. And it's a great part of our education. Yeah, it was a really cool I think so. Yeah, I think yeah. so. Yeah. When you're going down there, you know, everybody would know where the old Mill River bed was. So it, yeah. so it runs down between Cons and Pleasant Street, back in the gully, and then it, it goes in a pipe under the where the public health buildings are, Jack Fortier's building down there on Pleasant Street. So then it goes underground from there to the other side of Pleasant Street. It comes out under the old rail, the old rail, railroad bridge there. So there's a huge water course down there, which has all been filled in. Yeah. So that was the old Mill River bed. And also takes care of all the drainage in the lower portion of the city from, uh, um, from West Street. From Paradise Pond. Paradise Pond, Pond yeah. that yeah. whole area yeah. Yeah. in. It's all done before the river's out. That's right. <laughs> they pulled the big in there. <laughs> okay. Meetings adjourned. Thank you. Great. Thank, Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Nice job. Public. Good nice job. job. Thanks.